Welcome to this video where I'm going to be showing you guys how I designed and built this 3D printed modular work lighting system. And later in the video, we're going to be doing a comparison to this Milwaukee work light. And so I designed this system to be flexible and versatile, allowing me to individually adjust the brightness and direction of each of the LED panels. I can also connect and disconnect each LED unit to change the size of the overall assembly if I want. Mounting the LED panels is made simple with embedded magnets to stick to toolboxes, cabinets, and other things like car hoods or whatever other environment you're working within. Additionally, I made this spring-loaded stand to create a standing tower light. And this device conveniently runs off of a Milwaukee 12 volt battery, so it works well in my garage where I use a lot of Milwaukee tools. So now let's take a look at the design and the assembly of the devices so we can gain a better understanding of the finer details and we'll finish off with a test. Diving into the CAD model, let's first take a look at one of the LED tubes. On the top, you can see the LED panel and the button that controls the brightness of the panel. On the female end of the tube body, there's a PCB with pogo style pins that complete the electrical connection with the mating component. In the center, we have a magnet to keep the electrical connection tight, and you can also see the two green mating tabs that guide the physical connection. Note how that they are in asymmetrical positions in the housing to ensure that the connection is never backwards. On the opposite male end, there is only exposed copper rings to connect the pogo style pins on a female receptacle, and there are also asymmetrical keyways that coincide with the green mating tabs that I showed you on the female end, and a flathead screw to attract the magnet. Hiding the body reveals the backside of the PCB where you can see two red LEDs that glow when the tube has power, and the spine of the tube is also now visible where cross drills can be seen to allow wires to pass through. Near the female end, there are teeth and a ball spring plunger to allow for discrete positions of the LED panel. And finally on the bottom, you can see the mounting magnets that will be epoxied within the mounting feet of the tube body. Before assembling one of the tube bodies, we need to disassemble one of these dollar store LED lights. They can be found at most dollar stores. This one cost me $4 Canadian. It claims to be 900 lumens. And so I got three of them to complete three of the LED tube bodies because the LED panels and the button are gonna be reused in each of the LED tube bodies. Disassembly is pretty straightforward with all of the screws being located on the back cover. They simply just unscrew and the panel pops right off. The components I'm interested in saving here are the LED panel, the LED panel lens cover, the button, as well as the Cobb LED panel and the housing and lens for that Cobb LED panel. Seeing as how this is a dollar store light, all of the wires are extremely anemic and tiny, so I am gonna just clip those loose, not worry too much about them because I am gonna be replacing them later. I'm just gonna take note of the wiring positions, the polarity of the panel, and the polarity of the switch. And so how this panel works is that there is a single positive lead that comes off of the battery case and goes to the input side of the switch. On the output side of the switch, you can see how it gets distributed three different ways. And what this is, is a four position switch. So the fourth position is just off. But the first position goes to the Cobb LED. The second position goes to the dim setting. The third position goes to the bright setting on the LED panel. And we're going to, like I said, replace all these wires. But you can see here in its original form how this would work. And then the negative side of the battery case goes to the negative input of the LED panel. And that gets distributed both to the Cobb and to the LED panel itself. So now we're gonna pre-assemble some of the PCBs that are designed and made. There's a single PCB that is reversible, so that it can be used on both the male and female side of the connections. On the female side, we will use these pogo style pin connectors and solder them in place, and this is the only component required for this configuration. On the male side, the PCB is flipped over, and a 56 ohm resistor is soldered on, and two five millimeter LEDs are soldered to the back side. Each LED tube has a male and female side, so we will need to prep three of each configuration to make three full LED tubes. Now I'm going to begin assembling the 3D printed parts of the tube body. I've already gone ahead and tapped the thread for the 5 16 inch flathead screw and installed it into the one side of the spine. The other side has been tapped for an 833 thread and I'm gonna be installing this red shim to move the magnet out to make a stronger final connection and then I'm going to install the magnet using an 832 flathead screw. 
The red tube and insert will slip over the spine and cover the teeth. The 832 ball nose plunger will install into the hole and will adjust the depth by feel so there's a positive detent feel when we rotate the tube body around the spine. When I'm happy with how it feels, I can slip the spine and red end insert into the tube body and make sure the spine can still rotate freely. Now I'll grab the LED panel and switch that I removed from the dollar store light and start to modify the wiring. I'm using a 2.2 ohm 2 watt resistor to go from the third switch position, which is the bright setting, and then just a 22 gauge wire to go from the second switch position, which is the dim setting, and we're not going to be adding a resistor because the panel already has a 10 ohm resistor on the dim setting. I'm guessing the panel never came with a current limiting resistor on the bright setting because it originally ran off of three AAA batteries, which I'm assuming can't provide enough current to melt the panel down. In our case, we're using a tool battery, so I added that current limiting resistor on the bright setting so that the panel will not melt down. After that, I've gone ahead and cut two pairs of 22 gauge wires at 12 inches long each, and I'm gonna push the pairs through the two channels in the spine. I may have to slightly pull them back a little bit when pushing the spine back through the tube body to allow it to pass through those holes, uh, but once it's through, I can start fishing the wires into position for where I will eventually solder all of the connections. Now I'm going to take the male end PCB with the LEDs and solder my wires directly to the PCB with the red positive black negative convention. Now in the 3D model, you may have noticed that I had little JST connectors in there, but in this case, I figured I'm actually not gonna need them because once the tubes are assembled, I'm not gonna have to connect or disconnect those wires. So we're gonna solder them directly to the PCB. The male connection collars can then clamp down over the one on the spine using some number four by one half inch long thread forming screws. And the geometry of the flats on the spine and on the male connection collars will only let you install the collars one way. Some number four by a quarter inch long thread forming screws, then secure the PCB in place to those collars. At the female connection end, there are two pairs of wires to be soldered. One pair carries the voltage to the male end that we just completed, and the other pair goes to the switch and panel. You'll notice that I corrected the labeling on the PCB as I had the polarity reversed, and I've trimmed the wire length to fit nicely. Next, we can push the locking tabs into the female collars. They should be a press fit and the female connection collars clamp around the spine with the same four by one half inch long thread forming screws as we did on the male end, and the PCB will be secured with number four by one quarter inch screws, as was done also on the male end. The final two wires to be connected are the positive and negative leads carrying the voltage to the switch and panel. The red positive wire goes to the switch input and the negative goes to the far side pad on the panel. With those connections completed, we can reuse the rubber button from the dollar store light, as well as the clear lens. The 3D printed cover fits on top and gets secured with six number four by quarter inch long flathead thread forming screws. Finally, I can take the mounting magnets, insert them into the receptacles at the bottom of the tube body, and I'm gonna be using some generic hot glue to fill up the void there to keep those magnets from coming out. I'll scrape the surface clean, and that should be good enough to hold those magnets in. I've repeated this whole process two more times to make two more tubes, and now we can check the connection between two tubes. If the magnetic connection is not strong enough, you can unthread the 5 16th inch long flathead screw on the male end to move it closer to the magnet for a stronger connection. Before assembling the battery receptacle, or what I like to call the power base, we can take a look at the CAD model. The male end consists of the PCB in the same form as the male end of the light tube that we previously looked at. The female end accepts the Milwaukee M12 battery. Hiding some of the housing, you can see a hole here for a voltage regulator since we will be dropping the tool battery voltage from 12 volts down to something around 4.5 volts. There is a second PCB visible that houses a main switch to shut off power to all panels at once. This is an optional component, but I decided to include it since I had a bunch of these things left over from another project. The first thing I'm going to prep for the power base is the voltage regulator. This is a simple step down regulator that will take our 12 volt battery and switch the voltage down to four and a half volts. I'm connecting the leads from my 12 volt power supply to the input of the regulator and my meter is connected to the output. I can then turn the adjustment screw down until I achieve a steady four and a half volts. Next, we'll gather the 3D printed parts that make up the power base. I've tapped the hole for the 5 16th inch flathead screw and installed it in place. The main switch PCB has the spade terminal soldered in place 
that interface with the Milwaukee M12 battery. The switch has three positions with the center position being off. Because I'm salvaging this part from another project, I'm going to jumper the other two positions to be on positions because we only need two states, on and off. Then I can slip the voltage regular into the housing and put the PCB in place to lay out the wiring lengths that I'll need to connect my wires to the voltage regulator inputs. If you are recreating this project, this PCB is entirely optional as each light tube has its own switch. You would just need to find a way to secure some male spades to fit inside of the M12 battery and wire those directly to the regulator inputs. With all of the wires soldered, I can now put the regulator back inside of the housing and feed the output wires through the hole in the red 3D printed cap and secure the cap down with some number 4 by one half inch long thread forming screws. The male connection collars will fit over the red cap, but before securing those, we will need to solder the output wires to the PCB. Then, the male collars will fasten together with some number 4 by one half inch long screws and the PCB gets secured down with the number 4 by quarter inch long screws. On the receptacle side of the battery, four number six by three quarter inch long screws provide extra fastening strength and pull all the parts together. And if we did everything correctly, we can insert a battery and flip the switch and the red power status LEDs should come on to show that we do have power. When disassembling the dollar store lights, I had mentioned to save the small cob LED panels. As sort of a bonus device, I designed this tiny flashlight attachment using the cob panels. It mounts to a female receptacle and automatically turns on when the main power switch is turned on. Assembly of the flashlight module is pretty straightforward. The cap gets a magnet with an 832 flathead screw and the housing will hold the three cob panels. Each cob panel should have about 4.5 to 5 ohms of current limiting resistors in line with them. I had some 2.3 ohm resistors laying around so I put two in series to achieve 4.6 ohms of resistance for each cob panel. The cob panels slide into place and on the back I will wire each panel in parallel so each panel is connected to the 4.5 volt source. The lead wires pass through the hole in the cap and then they are soldered to one of the PCBs with the spring connector that we prepared earlier. Locking tabs are pressed into the female connection collars and the collars are clamped using the number 4 by one half inch long screws and the PCB is secured with the number 4 by quarter inch long screws like we've done with every other connector. The housing is secured with four number 4 by one half inch long thread forming screws and finally the cob lenses are added to the cover and the cover fastens down with number 4 by quarter inch long flathead screws. Then we can test the connection to the power base and see if we got our wiring right. In order to increase the stability of the system when being used as a tower light, I designed this spring-loaded base. The battery housing fits inside and the legs can be deployed by lifting the slip ring that holds them in the folded position. This model was actually inspired by landing legs I've seen on model rockets. What you can't see in the model here is that the tension is supplied by rubber bands, and so we'll get to that in a moment when we assemble this thing. Assembling the spring-loaded stand is done by first taking the slip ring and installing the elastics. I'm using elastic bands that I had to fold over several times to get the tension I needed and the elastics go over the hooks on the slip ring and you'll need three of them. Then I carefully slid the slip ring over the body making sure that the elastics don't get stuck. Then I'll hook the elastics onto the legs and use M3 by 35 millimeter long socket head cap screws and nuts to hold the legs in place. When the legs are not in use you can lift the slip ring up and tuck the legs away underneath the slip ring and the tension from the elastics holds the slip ring down and prevents them from springing back out. Lifting the slip ring will allow the legs to spring back out. Now I'll quickly demonstrate assembling the tower light configuration and it's pretty straightforward. First we start by inserting the M12 battery into the power base. From there the power base can get inserted into the spring loaded base once the legs have been deployed. Now I'll put that aside and I can start to assemble the three two bodies. I'm going to assemble all of these at once. You don't have to do it this way. You could put each two body onto the power base and stack them up individually. I'm going to just put all three together for the fun of it and then slap them all on top of that power base. Since the stabilizing legs were inspired by model rocket legs and the tower light somewhat resembles a model rocket, I designed and printed off this nose cone that attaches to the top of the tower light just for the fun of it to make it look more like an actual rocket. 
The stabilizing legs are quite effective and this tower light has a pretty tall center of gravity. So the spring loaded legs have to do quite a bit of work to stabilize this thing and keep it from falling over. I'm just gonna demonstrate how well they do work by hitting the light in different directions, simulating a scenario where maybe I bump into the light while I'm working. And you can see that the legs bring the tower back to the center and keep it from falling over. The flashlight component attaches to the power base the same way that the LED tubes do. And once it is in place, you can just flip the main switch and the flashlight should work. Now we can get into a quick comparison with the Milwaukee M12 floodlight. And so we'll start with overall brightness and I've brought both lights into my basement and when I turn them on, you can see that I've split the screen to show the two lights simultaneously. In person, the Milwaukee light appears to be a warmer tone, whereas my light appears to be cooler. On camera, there isn't too much of a difference and it might be the white balance of my camera affecting that. Overall, I do think the Milwaukee light is slightly brighter, so I will give it the edge in that department. The next comparison is the battery life. And the Milwaukee floodlight claims that on a four amp hour battery on the brightest setting, it will last about three and a half hours. By my calculations, my light will only last about two hours on the brightest setting with the same battery. So yeah, the Milwaukee takes this one too. Overall versatility was the next comparison and the Milwaukee light can stick to things magnetically, clamp onto things, and it can be carried with its handle. In comparison, the light that I built can also stick to things magnetically, but it cannot be clamped to things in its current state. I could design something later to make an attachment for that, and it can easily be carried around, so I say that's about even. In terms of the different brightness functions, my light has two different brightness settings, whereas the Milwaukee has three different brightness settings. However, with my light, I can individually adjust the brightness of each panel, as well as rotate them into different directions to distribute the light differently in the room as I see fit. Additionally, I can break my light down into smaller components and use only one LED tube light if I really want. And this is gonna save on battery life too. It won't be as bright as the Milwaukee light, but again, there is more added versatility with that ability. Overall, I think I'm gonna give the light that I designed the win in terms of versatility. The final comparison is going to be in impact resistance and durability, and the Milwaukee light will definitely take the win here as it is a injection molded light. Mine has been 3D printed of PLA parts, and if I drop mine, the likelihood of it breaking is quite high, but at the very least, I do have the 3D printable files, so I can fix mine. In conclusion, I will say that the Milwaukee light is a superior light overall, but it definitely was fun designing and building my own work light. I think the biggest factor holding back the light that I built is the quality of the LED panels that I used. It's pretty remarkable that five LEDs on the Milwaukee light will outperform 180 LEDs that make up the three individual panels in the light that I built. And it really goes to show that you get what you pay for in terms of LED technology. The Milwaukee light sells for about $100 Canadian around here. And I didn't calculate how much my project cost me because I did it for fun, but I don't suspect that I really saved any money doing it this way. Again, I just gained the experience of building something like this and I had a lot of fun doing it. So that's it for this build guys. I appreciate you guys watching this video. As always, check the video description down below where you'll find links to the design files for projects like this. I always provide my 3D printable files in all of my projects, as well as things like PDFs of schematics if there's wiring involved. So be sure to check that out and be sure to leave a comment in the comment section if you have any comments about this project. Maybe you have an idea to improve something like this, a design change that you'd like to see, or if you have any questions that would help you build your own, put them in the comment section. I always check the comments and I try and answer them all to help you guys build your own versions of my projects or just answer any of your comments or concerns in general. Thanks again for watching guys. I hope to see you guys in the next video.